Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the, I'm calling it the two o'clock slot. Maki Kato will be talking about PowerShell for our Perl experts. Maki, you're up. Very good. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all the organizers. And thanks for attending the conference. I hope you're having a good time. I am, uh, uh, my name is Maki, and I'm a lifelong learner. I'm interested in many things about computers, but in particular, I like pro programming languages. And earlier this year, I had the chance to really spend some time and, and sort of get to know uh, PowerShell, or at least get over the first hump of PowerShell. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it was a substantial effort, and I came 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 out of it thinking, uh, you know, I I could I could I I could use a little help here and there, and there was a lot of things that I gained that I feel like would trip other people up, and I and I thought I would, um, you know, sort of collect those together, and um, you know, make it uh, make it available, and that's about the time where I saw the the conference talk call for papers, so I submitted a proposal to basically. Uh, do a quick intro specifically for programmers, and I found a lot of resources that were, you know, getting started for, you know, administrators and, you know, other new programmers uh, for PowerShell, but I haven't really seen many that were specifically for programmers, so I'd like to address it that way, um, and uh, thanks for having me as your guide, your first 45 minutes in uh, with PowerShell, um, so let's get started, and like that. Okay, um, I got a couple text slides and then I'm going to switch to the terminal and, you know, basically walk through the simple things progressively harder. But, you know, in case you're here not knowing what PowerShell is, it's, um, it's a shell and a programming language. It, uh, it was, it's been around for about 13 years, I think, and it's been on the Microsoft platform for the most of its life until recently. Um, it is a .NET language built on the uh, CLR. And um, and since the .NET Core timeframe, which is fairly recent, it's been running on Linux and Mac OS. Uh, recently, also, I think maybe in the 2016 timeframe, it was made open source, and the code is available on GitHub. So that's what PowerShell is, and uh, it's uh, unique in a couple ways. Um, you know, the, it's the only shell that I know of that basically uh, pipes something other than text through pipes uh, from stage to stage. So, um, you know, in, um, in Bash and other Unix shells, you would, uh, you would cat a file to a pipe and then WC to count the number of lines that, you know, that's all based on text. Um, whereas uh, in PowerShell, everything that goes through the pipe is in fact not text. And it can be an array of text or array of lines or just a big one big blob of text. But in many cases, it is a, uh, you know, individual objects that go through the pipe. And so, um, so that basically makes it entirely different from, you know, the other uh, shells that you might know of. And, uh, and it's also somewhat unique in that, um, you know, it uh, allows you, it's a shell that allows you to actually interact with uh, um, the .NET classes in their DLL forms, the assemblies, and, uh, and that sort of thing. It's, it's not unique that way. I was going to say, you know, it was unique, but then I realized that, you know, um, I think Active State Perl has been able to manipulate .NET objects for a long time, and there's probably other modules that do that sort of stuff. So it's not unique that way, but it is uh, unique in that it comes from Microsoft and it's supported um, to um, to run on the, the .NET framework. I mean .NET CLR. Okay, so one of the things in my experience, oops, that um, that I had with working with PowerShell is that you know it uh, it's it's quirky. It's if it was just a programming language, I think things would be simpler. But it's not. It's really a shell, which means it's meant to be uh, interactive and it's meant to be the thing that people um, you know interact through in on a daily uh, or all day kind of situation. So so that makes it different from uh, just a pure programming language. Uh, and having uh, having that awareness actually helps you in situations where you come across a, a very strange, you know, behavior or a quirk of the language. You'll you that in the context of it being a shell, it sort of uh, explains a lot of things. 
So for example, the redirect, um, you know, uh, characters, the greater than and less than symbol are used for redirecting IO, which, uh, the, uh, and then they're so therefore not used in comparing integers or numbers, or for that matter, anything. Um, operators for comparison, uh, they use minus EQ, minus NE for not equal, minus LT, et cetera. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a, sh a shellism, I guess we can call it. Uh, and the last thing that, uh, you know, I'm going to point out and is um, there's a notion of aliases where, uh, you know, things are mapped. So, for example, um, you know, the get process, which will list all the processes uh, currently running, uh, is, uh, you know, aliased to the command PS, just to, you know, make it uh, more familiar to, you um, the POSIX shell users, I guess. Um, uh, when, it, when you come to programming it, um, I guess the best practice is considered to use the, the full name of these things instead of the abbreviated, uh, even though they are standard um, aliases, you know, best practice is to use the, the actual names of these commands. Um, and I, um, I, I've done this talk once before and it, um, there's not a whole lot of time, and I, I wish I could spend a lot more time explaining or, you know, uh, pointing out some of the um, shell natures, or you know, how to, how to be effective in the in the PowerShell shell. But I'm uh, going to skip all that mostly and focus on the programming aspect of it. Um, you'll you'll find a lot of videos and other resources that will tell you about you know how to combine these thousands of uh, commandlets they're called um, and produce you know output and to use the uh, the shell as a shell. But uh, one of the tips that I have is if you if you're using the cmd.exe shell, stop using that now and switch to, you know, PowerShell, you could do everything in PowerShell and that'll get you at least started, you know, playing with the shell. And that's, a, that's definitely a, a tip if you're, if you're not doing that already. All right. So hello world. Oh, even before the hello world, I thought I'd mention a couple more things. Um, Windows 10 today comes with the version 5.1 of PowerShell standard. Uh, this happened in the recent years, um, but there's also another version called uh, PowerShell 7, 7.1, 7 7.1 7 preview. I think there's a new release that just came out today, maybe even. Uh, and these are, um, these can be run side by side and the six and seven version of PowerShells are what's considered uh, running on the, the .NET Core. So those are the more recent ones and they have new features. Uh, I recommend using 7, you know, 7.0, 7 7.1. 7.0 is the, the release version. 7.1 is currently in pre-release, that sort of thing. Uh, and I, if you're looking for an environment for it, you know, visuals, uh, VS Code is excellent. There's good support for it. There's extensions. I do uh, believe there's plenty of um, v Vim and Emacs uh, options as well. So if you like that, you can do that. However, the first thing, if you're running on Windows and you try to run a script, you're going to be prompted with this big red um, error text that says uh, you can't run that. The policy of the machine doesn't allow you for to run that. So, and it's basically a uh, safeguard um, security mechanism for protecting the, the, you know, the millions of desktops that are out there from running, uh, unintendedly running shells, shell scripts. Uh, so that I think the policy is set uh, on a domain machine to execute only if it's signed by the right code signing mechanism. And otherwise it will flat out not run PowerShell scripts. Uh, it's easy to enable it. I think you just need to run the command execution policy bypass and there will be a link for that there as well as, you know, the error will actually have a link to link you through. But long story short, when you see that, just go ahead and enable the policy bypass and um, you're good to go. There's really no other sensible option. So since you are programming and you are going to run this. And by the way, uh, versions 5.1 and 7.1, they can be run side by side. You just need to uh, know where your paths are. All right, let's get started with um, some, some easy stuff, numbers and strings. So uh, numbers are numbers and strings are strings, uh, but this is a dynamically typed language. So you can do stuff like ABC and plus one, which does something kind of normal and uh, 
this will probably give us an error. Yep. Um, the the first the first one uh, ABC plus one that's basically the one is being re, you know recasted to um, a string because it knows it needs to act a string. So uh, type conversion happens everywhere, and that's uh, you know it's just the nature of the dynamic language and the nature of the shell. And uh, let's see. Well, let's do some. Um, you know, one of the things I really uh, it took me a while to get get to, but um, uh, it would really help you if you're just trying to figure out well, what's going on. Get type dot full name gives you the oops. <laughs> that's a good example of what not to do. Uh, and I'll talk about this part a little bit later. Um, but you can basically interrogate anything uh, expression inside of parentheses get type dot full name. Um, and that, you know, that gives you some bearings as well. Uh, you know, I like to sort of figure out what the hell that came back from that you know, invocation and like that. Um, the uh, strings can have, uh, what do we do? So dollar $A equals ABC. And then we can do dollar, then actually we can do hello dollar $A and, you know, um, variable substitution happens inside double st quoted strings. Single quoted strings don't get that. And uh, what else? There's here strings, um, just like the other shells. And uh, one interesting fact is that it understands, uh, you know, kilobytes and megabytes and those other things. Um, so that's handy, especially if you're uh, if you want to instruct to allocate storage, you can allocate it in gigabytes directly or you can write a function that understands those sorts of things. All right, I think that was it. So next. All right, so inside strings, um, one of the things, um, one of the things that I, you know, I, I spend, ended up spending a little bit of time figuring out is, you know, you know in order to quote something, it's not, it's not a, a backslash, right? Uh, it's going to be backtick. So that's backtick is your new backslash in PowerShell. And so um, inside a string, backtick n becomes um, a new line. And backtick zero is effectively the same as backslash zero in bash and so on and so forth. Uh, one uh, final thing is that you can, um, when you, when you, when you, when you break up a line, you can actually break up a line with, a, if you end the line with a backtick, it will continue on to the next line and then you can do stuff like that. So the backtick at the end of the line, uh, handy to know. Okay. All right, we're gonna go to variables. I already showed you one variable. All variables are gonna start with a dollar sign, uh, unlike Perl, where the type um, plays into the whatever these prefixes are. Uh, so, um, and there, um, because it's a shell, there's uh, special variables like OFS, I think, yep. And um, lots of lots of special variables, uh, except there is one that I really wanted to share with you, which is true. And although true when evaluated, you know, comes back as capital true, it is in fact the, um, true is the Boolean uh, true. Uh, and, but capital true is not. Capital true ends up being just a plain string and evaluated most of the time. This 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 really um, threw me for a loop. It took me a long time to to dig that out. I couldn't believe it that you know it it ended up taking a variable form and than anything else. So that and of course false is the same. And uh, the other one that you're going to need is dollar null. It's going to be null. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other special variables that you may need, and you can find those as you go along. Okay, let's talk a little bit of types. And by the way, um, I did say um, expression in, in in parentheses with get type full name. Uh, the get type doesn't have to be case sensitive. It can be any case, and I'm, I'll be typing it lowercase from here. Um, you have things like uh, so. So ls, by the way, is um, uh, alias to something. What is it? Uh, get child item. I keep 
forgetting that. But anyway, so ls um, returns something. And uh, if I do that, you know, a bunch of things. Uh, so let's, there's a handy function that I'm going to share with you. Um, not function, they're commandlets. Uh, get member. And the, this, um, this is going to be the few things that I'm going to show you of that sort. There's thousands of commandlets and you're going to need to, you know, know more as you go. Uh, but this one is particularly helpful in figuring out um, what you're working with. And uh, so get member will return the type of the objects that's coming back out of the pipe. In this particular case, it's unusual. You saw my, f my, you know, my, my listing of files. Uh, one thing about this is there's files and directories. And so there's two types of objects that came out of that particular, you know, ls into pipe. And uh, one of them is going to be the directory info, and the other one's going to be file info, and they show both of them to you. And this is basically a .NET object, and it's going to show you all the uh, members, the properties, and you can adjust some of these. But, but, but between the get type, full name, and a get member, you can sort of navigate your way through all these things that, that are happening and debug and figure out what the hell's going on. And, uh, and you, you can probably need to do that. Um, all the .NET types are available, and uh, sometimes you will need to load the assembly, and that's a you know separate process. But otherwise, you can uh, you know you can manipulate, you can use uh, allocate collections, etc. from all of the .NET system. And I won't talk any about that, but there's plenty of good resources for that. All right, moving on to arrays and lists. So that will um, create an array. It turns out comma is not a um, separating token. It's actually an operator. And uh, so therefore, uh, syntactically, that's actually correct. And comma two ends up, I think, returning a, and I guess we could try this out. Uh, an array of objects. Everything's an array of objects, even integers. Uh, so it's basically the generic list is Array. Um, you can allocate a, um, a .NET uh, array of integers, or for that matter, .NET array of anything, if, if that's what you want to do. And that will then limit what kind of objects can go in. But otherwise, you know, when you're using this as a shell, it's just array of objects and stick anything in and pull anything out and, you know, life, life is good. All right, um, another, where were we? We're talking about arrays and, um, and, and lists. And in particular, I wanted to point out, this is a uh, very idiomatic uh, to use the double dot range operator to uh, generate a lot of things. And so uh, it's not uncommon to see double dots piped into uh, for each dot dot dot. So that's very uh, idiomatic. And uh, there is, uh, you'll see littered, uh, the code littered with uh, things like this. And that is the um, array creation operator at open paren. Um, and it, um, it may you know, creates an array out of anything pretty much. Uh, but in particular, it's used uh, where uh, sometimes, you know, you want to write a function or a commandlet that uh, that's expecting an array. And um, sometimes in the processing, you don't know if you're going to get a single object back or an array object back. And so you just wrap it in one of these and you know it's always going to be an array. When you, got, when you get the single object back, it'll, it'll make it into an array. If it get an array back, it does nothing. So it doesn't make an array of an array. It just does the right thing. So that's kind of handy to know. And let's go to hash tables. And of course, we need, uh, we need hash because can't imagine. Um, and by the way, I'm using the um, the brand new Windows terminal. If you haven't tried it, it's really nice. This is the 1.1 preview, but you know it has color. Um, and the color I think comes from the uh, the latest uh, PowerShell 7 has the colorization. I, I didn't do anything special. This is out of the box. I know there's fancy ways to customize the prompt, which I wanted to do, but haven't gotten around to. But nonetheless, here we are. Um, hashes are at sign open brace, and then name value pairs separated by semicolon. And uh, you know these work exactly as you expect. Um, 
you can do hash dot keys. And I think command line command completion does work. Keys is a property, so it returns the, all the keys. You can use that to iterate over things. Or you can also do, uh, I think you can do count, because this is a collection. Yep. Okay. Um, if you wanted to iterate over the key value pairs, um, you're going to have to call hash dot get enumerator, which is a um, basically a dot net method on the collection. And so then you end up doing stuff like hash dot enumerator, and you can do for each object. And I'll just skip ahead and uh, you know use the. Uh, Which object. So this, this, you know, so it gives you key value pairs, which are called dictionary entries, and and uh, they don't display other than to like that. But if I, you know, if I did uh, dot, if it's like key, it'll do the key, right? Yep, good. All right, so that's hash tables, and hash tables are everywhere, just like I'm sure that's uh, Python and Perl, just like that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about objects. Uh, the, the pattern that you want to see or you want to use is, let's see if I have it. Yeah, there you go. So um, basically, it's a, I'm assigning a variable. New object is the commandlet, and I'll talk about this in just a second, but you pass it arguments, and one of the arguments that you pass is the, is the, the class name. And um, this allows you to, um, allocate .NET objects that you can then interact with. So, or um, yeah, that's what you're going to do. Uh, uh, I guess I'll talk about also the uh, the casting. I guess I skipped over that accidentally. Um, so you cast with a, you, you basically express type with um, with a square bracket. And this, um, this is a uh, the integer. And what I wanted to show was, um, this is how you call the. Um, so that's the that basically gives you access to the static methods of static properties of the uh, of the .NET class. So there you go. And I, yep. all right, finally, uh, we're talking about expressions and statements. Um, so first there is terms like numbers and strings, and then there's operators. And by the way, um, it you know. .NET, um, not .NET, PowerShell has a lot of uh, good operators. Oh, and I forgot to mention, and um, maybe this comes up in the tip section, but it has a wonderful help system. And so, and, and I, I do, uh, and you'll find lots of good videos that introduce the help system in like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with it, but, uh, and, and it has, you know, everything you're gonna need to, to really program in, um, in PowerShell, uh, the help, so help about is what I use a lot. And this lists to the, uh, what is it doing now? It's going to fetch from the internet, something. Um, and about operators is what I really wanted to show you. And this will give you, uh, you know, everything about the operators that you're gonna to need to know. So I did wanna mention that, spend the time to learn the help system. There is, um, there's exactly the same help, the basic help, is available on the web page, which I link from the resources. And I end up just liking the presentation better. So I end up using that just as much as I use the uh, command line help, but but uh, the content seems to be the same. Okay, so then, so we have terms, we have operators. And by the way, um, one of the things that, again, tripped me up a little bit was that um, formatting strings is, um, is a operator business. So it's not, printf or whatever else it kind of looks like this where you have a string and then you have the minus f operator which is the format operator and then you pass it um, an array of objects and hopefully they match up and they get printed so in this case and you know this is not the POSIX standard it's probably the .NET standard and uh, this says basically uh, just the first item the straight next string is, I guess, 10, 10, 10 characters wide. And then there's the uh, floating point. All right. So the format operator. 
Next. Um, Okay, finally, we're getting back to, and this is where I need to switch my slides. Just wanted to show you the uh, the invocation of a statement. So statements basically end up being a command name, a switch parameter, or a parameter with an argument, and any number of switch parameters and parameters with an argument, and potentially potential um, positional arguments. So that's, um, and the command, so the, the thing that arrives first is the command, and that can be uh, basically what we call commandlets, which uh, are spelled cmdlets, which are basically um, built-in compiled uh, built-ins for the shell. And um, they're, I guess they're linked in um, or they're loaded when you first start up. There are tons of them and they work together. They usually, you know, understand how things come out of the the pipe and the object form, and or they produce stuff, list of objects, whatever it is. And uh, you know, there's one for everything. Uh, the help system actually has a way to find particular all, all the commands uh, and or particular commands or commands with uh, with uh, with a filter. Uh, but here's an example. Uh, get process, which is PS equivalent, minus name, star high, minus file version info. And minus file version info is a switch parameter. It takes no arguments, but its presence signals a, a change in state. Uh, the minus name is a normal argument. And I think in, 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 in reality, it, this is a, uh, it also understands uh, the first positional argument is, I think, defaults to the name. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but anyway, so it, it, uh, this, the command can be commandlets, functions, scripts, or native executables. Native executables, hopefully they understand, uh, you know, arguments on the command line. If not, they'll just start. It could be notepad, and it'll just start notepad. Um, a um, a function is uh, basically defined in the PowerShell programming language, and we'll talk mostly that's what we're focused on here. And a script is a PowerShell script. And commandlets, like I said, are usually reserved to mean um, the pre-compiled, uh, you know, built-ins for PowerShell. You can write these in C Sharp, or you can, um, well, what I'm trying to say is that functions can be, um, can you can write basically commandlet equivalents in, um, in functions. So you can do everything. So the, there's a really a blurry boundary between commandlets and functions. Um, and maybe you don't need to know the difference. If, if, you be, uh, if you're writing modules, for example, you could write all of it in, in PowerShell code and not needing any C sharp and it'll still Basically, you can publish that and share it, and it'll be no different than a commandlet, other than it comes with source code. So, commandlets, and uh, and that's the statements. Statements are terminated with a semicolon if you need to, and um, otherwise, it is um, it is uh, I well that, that terminates. With semicolon, I think uh, there's other ways to terminate it, but but mostly you're going to want to know. Um, <clears throat> okay, back to my terminal. Okay, here is uh, so there's um the one thing that I wanted to point out, and this is a little bit quirkiness, uh, the shellism again of PowerShell. There, so there's this notion the parser sort of has two modes, and it switches between what's known as command mode and expression mode. And uh, you, you could look this up, uh, but basically, I, I hope I can explain it to you. So write output, my example. Write output is basically the uh, echo equivalent, I suppose. And, um, and when we do 2 plus 2, uh, you'd expect it to really return. Well, it, it's a little bit surprising that it actually returns 2 plus 2. And so what it did was it interpreted that as a string. And this is, this is the behavior of the command mode parsing. So um, what it's trying to do is it's trying to, uh, you know, parse the arguments to send to the command. And in, in, in that mode, it basically treats, you know, everything as strings. 
uh, unless it has reasons to do so, do otherwise. Uh, if you wanted to force, and oftentimes you do, you would have to put a, um, you know, parens around it. And actually, the opening of the paren actually shifts the parser into the expression mode, and it uh, it goes from there. Um, so that's the thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, there's another thing about um, uh, the, the the parser that it knows that this line is incomplete. So I wrote two and a plus, and it knows that plus doesn't end anything. So it's expecting more to come. And so I could do that. Uh, however, there's a little bit of an interesting situation where uh, it actually thinks, well, that ended, uh, that ended that. But why didn't it print? Oh, no, it didn't. OK, so it. You would think it actually um, would have figured out that that's incomplete, but it doesn't. And it, um, well, it, 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 um, <clears throat> it's not happy about that. So, um, but yeah, you know, I think the best thing to do is if you really want to sort of terminate a line, um, you just uh, to for completeness sake, you can put a back quote, and then you can do the plus two or whatever. Okay. So the command mode and expression mode. I uh, just wanted to touch on that. Okay. All right. If statements. This is about where um, we get back onto track with more normal programming language. So I, uh, so the if statement syntax is you know if condition and the print are not optional, and then uh, the what's known as uh, I guess block or script block. Um, and I don't really have to write an output, so I can just say two. Uh, and or you could do, you know, if condition block, else if condition, and so on and so forth. You can look these up. So that's kind of normal. And I'm not going to go into details about that. Oops. All right. So, um, and I'm not going to probably go into details about the switch statement, the for statement, the for each statement, and the while statement, which, you know, it, you're going to have to look it up when you need to use it. And that's kind of that's okay. There's nothing too special about it other than the switch statement is a little bit um, uh, different from C and or C sharp. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I do want to touch on the, the subtle difference between for each and for each object. So for each object is uh, one of those things, uh, one of the commandlets. It's wonderful command. It does a lot of different things. Uh, among other things that it does, is it takes a uh, you know array of objects and and it takes a script block and in that block you can reference the and so each of the objects are going to be evaluated in this block and it's represented as dollar underscore and you can do things like well add four to each of those and you know you'll get the this, so this is um, uh, an array of one, two, three. And uh, for each of those objects, we're adding four to them. So we end up with five, six, and seven. So this is kind of like a, you know, it's a um, sort of a functional programming style. And by the way, if you are interested in functional programming, there is uh, several blog posts about uh, functional programming in PowerShell. And the guy goes into pretty good detail about that. So if you, it, I guess to some degree, you can do that. Ultimately, it's not a functional language, so it's not quite the same. But this is quite idiomatic. I found that um, that you, you pass objects into the for each object and you do something for each of them. OK. Um, what I wanted to point out that there is a language construct called for each. And that one evaluates like this. So there's two, there's actually three for each's and I'll touch on the third one next. Uh, this is just a, so we can say dollar X in uh, one dot dot three. And uh, then we can say dollar X. So that's, this is the, okay. We'll make it the same as above. And that's exactly the same. The only difference is, so this one note that there is a parentheses and inside the parentheses, the dollar in blah, blah, blah. So that's the, the, the language construct for each as opposed to the for each object. Uh, there seems to be no particular uh, standard, although for each object actually it functionally does a lot more. So sometimes you use that uh, for each. 
uh, the language contracts for each, um, I think has a performance advantage and it, you know, it's faster in certain cases or in many, in the, in the limited cases that I can handle, it's I think faster. And the finally, there is an alias called uh, for each, which actually um, maps it to for each object. Uh, and this, uh, this was something that I found confusing and baffling. Um, and, and speaking of idiomatic and commandlets, there is another one called the where object, and then there's a select object. And those three are like the, the foundation uh, for you know working with uh, PowerShell. That's used everywhere. And you, you kind of imagine what it is. The where object actually sort of filters the list, and the select object will actually, for each of the objects, select properties out of it. Um, and that's, that's how it works. And it's good. Um, so we got covered up to there. All right, so now we're getting into the functions and this from here, it's sort of somewhat downhill and I am going to mostly just show you some of the, the code um, and, uh, and talk about, uh, before I can talk about that, I'm gonna talk about the unnamed functions which are also known as script blocks. And basically it's this notion of, uh, you can have a, uh, you can have a, you know, unevaluated block, although, you know, that one actually evaluated it, but if you assign it to a variable, it actually doesn't, and you can evaluate it later. And you can also pass it as an argument to, you know, the commandments that you're writing, uh, you can pass it around, and it's exactly what's happening on this line right over here, where it says for each object, you know, dollar plus four. Okay, so functions are defined uh, with uh, function keyword and I, you know at this point I'm going to switch to my here is a example of a function yeah. so functions are defined with the function keyword uh, the function name uh, optionally the parameter list and a you know bracket and a list of statements uh, statements can terminate uh, can terminate with the line or with a semicolon as necessary. You can put two statements on the same line with a semicolon in between as well. Uh, in this particular case, this file actually has a function, and it will basically uh, call. and And this is uh, an example of a function saying that it has a default. So when I execute my my hello, it will actually say hello world, and when I say my hello John, it will say hello John, like that. All right, and uh, so then um, we get into a little more. Um, one remark that I want to make about functions is while they are defined and they look like a function, they, they look like they take a parameter, but they don't. You don't invoke it with, uh, so I have, so let's just do this. So say I, say I define the function, right? And, uh, and you know, this. so notice that I'm invoking the function without the parens. And that's the point that I wanted to make is that while you do define it like other languages, you don't invoke it with the parens. You still invoke functions just like a commandlet. And um, um, by the way, there's a lot uh, written about the command. It's called command binding that, um, and um, uh, that's uh, another topic that you'll probably want to write read about at some point. Okay, so I am running out of time. So let's, uh, I got some code that I wanted to show you just to give you some idea. So from here on, I think it's sort of like a normal language. You're going to figure out that you're going to want to write a couple functions uh, and and uh, you know combine them together with other things that are part of the system. So I will just go through uh, these examples. Uh, this little magic here, commandlet binding open print close print makes this function uh, compatible with um, the, what am I trying to say? Com compatible with the, uh, the, the commandlets. So which is to say that it, it takes a certain default arguments, uh, it has certain behavior that it inherits and so on and so forth. The param actually keyword, or it looks like a, a method uh, invocation, it 
allows you to specify attributes about the, uh, the parameter. And in this case, uh, we're saying it's a first positional parameter as well as it can take values from the pipeline. It does have a type of string and um, it is na name is dollar forward or forward. Um, and this will be invoked with, uh, you know, the function name, by the way, the function name is up here. And I did want to point out that this is sort of the standard format for writing um, uh, comments and doc strings or doxygen like uh, comments, I guess. And uh, this allows the help system to actually pull out and create help pages for you automatically, which is kind of neat. The, uh, the command, uh, the, the comment character is the sharp or the pound sign. Uh, and the multi-line comment is the angle pound closing with the uh, angle, pound close angle. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, just wanted to, I guess, explain the, the name here is uh, variable reverse is uh, we're creating an array of uh, characters from the input, which is a string. And um, then we call the static method of array to reverse it. And then we, uh, here's another operator that comes in handy, the join operator. So string.join in other languages ends up being uh, an operator in PowerShell. And so you have the left hand is the list of characters that we're joining with no space in between, resulting in a, in a string that's inverted. All right, I got like five more minutes before the, uh, and then, so we're gonna end up right here on, uh, and I did mention um, objects. So um, PowerShell allows you to write your own classes so that you can pass along objects to, you know, the next stage in the pipeline, which could be your own code as well. Anyway, so in this particular example, we have um, a class called student. Uh, and as you declare the instance variables, you end up um, calling them, you, you need to give them type, give them name. Here's a constructor. Inside the constructor, you can reference the new object with a this. It's sort of all straightforward, I think. Uh, another class, in this case, it's uh, here's the uh, dollar student. We have a method, add student. Um, the receiver is referenced as this. And here's another example of, uh, here's an example of creating a new object of the student type. And uh, hopefully, yep, you can see what I'm doing. And, um, and there you go, uh, get roster, you're defining a method that returns an array. Uh, here's a return statement. Uh, you don't really need a return statement uh, because it will return the last statement that was evaluated. Uh, but in this particular case, we have a list of, uh, this dot student is going to be an array and we're putting it through the, the um, pipe and we're sorting it. And then we are, uh, we're basically sorting it with the grade and the name property. Uh, here's an example of the where object where we take that list, we filter it by uh, grade equals grade. And then we, we sort it with just the name. So there you go. So that is an example of, um, the uh, classes and invocation and methods and like that. Um, since I'm here, I thought I'd mention to you. So these, by the way, these um, are actually submissions from a site called um, Exorcism, which is one of my favorite language learning sites. And uh, they do have a PowerShell track. I linked it in my, I, I was not able to find it at one point. It wasn't published and, um, and uh, but anyway, oops, that's not quite what I meant to do. Okay. Um, and uh, what I was talking about was so there is a well accepted um, unit testing framework called Pester. And that's the uh, that's the code that we're looking at right now. And uh, so uh, so we basically, you know, describe the test and uh, run these things. So anyway, so uh, 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 this is from um, Exorcism. And that's, um, that's a site where you basically, you get uh, structured problems uh, in great gradual structured problems. You have to answer and submit a working pro uh, problem. The problem is stated with a readme file as well as the, they give you test cases. So you basically need to, you're going to be running the code until, you're going to be modifying your code, running the test until it passes. And once it passes, you submit the 
And once you submit, you can get to look at other people's um, solutions. And I found it tremendously useful to look through everybody else's, um, you know, submissions to find, you know, what, you know, what people, and you, you'll find about like two to 5% of people really have done this before or, you know, are, are very familiar with it. And they produce the answers that you, know, you look at it immediately and say, ha, huh, how did they do that? Or, ha, huh, that's how I really want to write my code. And that's sort of kind of the, the, the best part of the learning experience is that, you know, after you've done some active problem solving, you get to look at other people's and, and learn from that. And I think that's typical of any programming language where you spend a lot of time reading code and you learn from, you know, people that are really good uh, how they did that. All right, so this is about the end of my um, presentation. I'm going back to my slides. And uh, the, the, here's the Exorcism website. And it's linked from my resources page. The resources page, by the way, is, um, oh, modules. I forgot this about modules. So the thing about modules is that everything is collected on a website. Uh, it's called PowerShell Gallery. You go here, you look for it. It's just like, you know, any other language with the module dependency, uh, you know, ecosystem. And there's a lot of wonderful packages. And there's also a lot of documentation about how to produce your own modules. And, and you know, that's just like any other language. So. Nothing special there, but the learning resources I collected all together, I put it onto my web page, which is at the right here at the bottom of the slides. Um, oops, you don't want that. How do I make that go away? Here it is. Okay. Um, and so I think I have a few minutes, right, for questions if there are any. Um, uh, moderator, can you help me out? Four minutes. I have 12 minutes. Yeah, if we have four minutes. On four this. minutes, yes. Okay. So um, please, if anyone has a question. Oh, here, I guess maybe there's some comments in the chat, which I haven't been able to follow. Sound was good. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they can't use backslashes, so they use, need to use backticks. And that's good. All right. So hopefully this uh, was... Love you as a question for you. Oh, yeah. There you go. One question. Go ahead. I would so like to ask it. Oh. Uh, do you need the capitalization of each word? No, capitalization is optional, and I, uh, I, uh, yeah, it's it's not case sensitive for the you know for the function names and uh, variable names and that sort of stuff. Uh, Fulvio, if you have a question, go for it. Oh, I'm sorry. There's. Uh, have you had a chance to use PowerShell on Linux? Can you see any particularly good case for it there? So the, the case for PowerShell on Linux uh, is going to be like this. If you are a Microsoft shop and you have like a few Linux workstations and you want to manage everything from PowerShell, then that's one of the case. And the other case is you're a Microsoft shop and you're running, you, you're actually starting to run your web applications written in um, .NET Core and you're deploying on Linux servers because they're cheaper that way. Um, that's another case where you'll probably use PowerShell. And um, I have not uh, personally used PowerShell on, and the downside of, of PowerShell on Linux is that uh, it's, it's, it's rather bloated, right? So because you need to install the, um, the whole .NET Core ecosystem uh, before you can even run PowerShell. So, so it's, not, it's not about to replace Bash in my environment um, just for that, but you know, I think there are compelling cases. And um, the, the one thing, two more things that I didn't mention is that PowerShell is also a remoting technology. So built into PowerShell, there's you know the equivalent of SSH. Um, and so you can remote manage uh, machines from one PowerShell to the other. And the other thing is uh, there's this notion called desired state configuration, DSC, and you can read about it, but it's basically you can force configuration state onto machines and manage machines that way. And I, if you're a Microsoft shop and you have a few Linux boxes and you want to manage it that way, then that's the reason that you roll out PowerShell onto that. So that was an additional question from Fulvio that I'm going to relay. And the question was oh, uh, what, uh, what, what led you to PS as a language? So um, I actually took this up because I was starting a um, Azure uh, project with a client and um, I've always wanted, uh, so I, I manage a lot of uh, 
Linux servers as well as Windows servers. And I've always wanted to, you know, get better at, you know, managing my Windows server using PowerShell. Um, you know, the alternative is to basically RDP to the server and restart IIS, that sort of thing. Whereas with PowerShell, you can sort of do that all remotely, potentially. Uh, so I, I've been really wanting to, and I never really had the chance until, you know, I, I took this uh, opportunity with the client. And, um, you know, I basically said, uh, I'm going to bring this to the table so I can do automation and I can do, um, uh, yeah, so Azure DevOps and writing scripts for that. Um, it's really what's really fun about it is that it really gives you a huge amount of control over Windows servers. Um, like everything you can do on all the enterprise software that Microsoft has, you can do it from, from PowerShell. So that's you know Microsoft's really put in effort to make their automation story sort of really compelling, and so so I I, I recommend it for that. Thanks a lot, uh, Maki, for your talk. I think we are running out of time. And uh, of course, the discussion can uh, stay online and uh, people can reach you, I think, directly on uh, for the Slack if you are there. Uh, thank, but thank, you. thank you very much. Um, I will be available. Uh, you can email me there, but I'm also going to be available on Slack, uh, the, uh, the conference Slack. I'll, I'll check if you had mentioned me. I'll try to respond to you. I am going to attend the next couple uh, speaking uh, tracks uh, talks that are scheduled so i won't be available immediately but thank you so much i hope uh hope i was a good guide for you for the first 45 minutes of your powershell thank you a lot of very good positive feedback from the chat uh a lot of applause i appreciate that have a great day